All right, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking around late. My name is Greg Bunce. I'm with Intel IT. I'm in the engineering group within the hosting portfolio. And my responsibility is automation and enterprise integration. And I've got with me Sridhar. Hi, I'm Sridhar Mahankali. I'm uh, also part of uh, Intel IT engineering. And within that, uh, I focus mostly on the cloud infrastructure architecture. And uh, I've grown up in the networking uh, side of the house. Uh, so there's a lot of networking background. But uh, right now, look at the, the infrastructure architecture. All right, stand, standard uh, legal disclaimer. And on to the agenda. So tonight, we're going to talk to you about Intel's IT cloud transformation and journey why we selected OpenStack for our control plane strategy, uh, our control plane status and plans, automation framework, workforce transformation, and, and call to action. We'll have summary and wrap up at the end. Since we're the last presentation, we can probably stick around and talk uh, among ourselves a little bit longer if, if folks desire. Is my mic overdriven? OK. <clears throat> So our, our IT cloud transformation started back in the 2009 timeframe when we made the shift to virtualization. So we, we brought in a virtualization platform and, and started to transform our hosting business from one of 90 plus days to land an application, very siloed in terms of capacity, uh, extremely manual in terms of how you interacted with IT as a customer. And then uh, you know, variability in terms of reliability. In 2010, we turned on our first implementation of uh, our, our private cloud at, at the end of that year, right? So we drove through a P2V process to pick up workloads running on physical platforms, move them to virtualized, and uh, got from a 10-day native you know, virtualization kind of throughput down to less than an hour for folks through self-service to come through and request their, their virtual resources. In 2014, we're driving toward a hybrid cloud, converged cloud strategy. As, as, as our enterprise sits, 75% plus of our enterprise is virtualized. We offer on-demand compute network and storage. And uh, We've got full, full self-service, service request fulfillment with uh, four nines availability. In, in the last two years, we've, we've actually done qu quite a lot in terms of you know, cl cloud enablement. So it, it hasn't all been an IAS virtualization story. We also have some SaaS success stories. So some, some limited applications starting to come into um, IT and, and, and onto our customers in a, a SaaS model, right? And these, these are huge, hugely disruptive, but it, in a great way, right? It, it, it transforms the face of IT. Also in the platform as a service space, we turned on Cloud Foundry as our PaaS offering last year, and we're driving our uh, environment such that you know, our, our end users, our developers can conceive of an idea and have it deployed and running in production in less than a day. And then in, in, in the IAS space, we uh, have, have taken what was our proprietary and internally developed automation control framework and are shifting toward uh, OpenStack for a control plane. And that's, that's the premise of, of this discussion here today. Go, go deep. So, you know, Cloud 1.0 for us was, you know, all about velocity, reduced instance, sustained operations. Uh, get, getting to less than an hour for VMs, uh, really minimize our incidents and downtimes, and, and you know, just, just run IT, right? But now, now in 2014, it's, it's a very different landscape. We are um, you know, do, doing idea to production in less than a day, zero downtime, our customers should never experience an outage, and we're doing this in the face of flat budget and uh, downhead down down count, right? The point of this foil is really just to illustrate um, the, 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 the current environment, so we're still, we're still pushing across. But on the left-hand side, you can see, you know, yes, we've got this, um, this proprietary automation that does fulfill self-service for some of our environments, 
but other environments are still stranded and quite siloed and, and, and highly manual. So with our OpenStack control plane, we will be able to extend um, similar functionality across our entire environment, transform the way that we do our network architecture, our security architecture, and, and really pass on all of this goodness to our end users. When, when you know, we went through the process of selecting OpenStack and, and, and revalidating our, our control plane strategy with our CIO, we, were, we, we looked at it in terms of uh, what, what Intel calls QVAC, quality, velocity, efficiency, capability, right, as our four main vectors. So in, in a velocity vector standpoint, what OpenStack gives us is, is a very forward-leaning um, means to service development, delivery, and operation. It is also natively geared toward agile methodologies, DevOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, right? And th these are things that um, are exactly where we're trying to take IT because they align with what our end using customers are doing. You know, so, so instead of um, feeling as though CICD and Agile are things that our vendors are doing or things that our customers are doing and are being imposed on IT, we're, we're trying to drive it from the infrastructure up Capability-wise, OpenStack is, is really um, you know, the, the, the perfect automation framework. It's defined by its APIs. This allows us to, to not only stitch it into our environment in whatever way we have to, but it gives us a, a, an, an extremely rapid way of delivering line of business requirements. And then, you know, again, from an efficiency and quality standpoint, kind of back to the DevOps tool chain, right? So we, we leverage the same tool chain used by the OpenStack community, used by our end using customers to deliver IT infrastructure. So what, what this represents to our customers is, is really an up-leveling of capability. They, they are able to do things across the environment, you know, regardless of what hypervisor they're sitting on, once we've uh, fully rolled out this control plane strategy. So it's, it's broken into phases. Phase one is put the, the control plane over our existing infrastructure, giving the customer start, stop, delete, snapshotting capabilities, um, self-service volume, create and attach, um, resizing functionality. The, these are all things today that would require, in the legacy environment, a manual ticket. I need, I need more vCPUs, I need more RAM, and that, that takes a couple of days to percolate through the system. Phase two that comes on a little bit later um, in the year is importing all of that metadata that's sitting um, in, in our existing cloud environment into OpenStack so that customers who have VMs that were built by hand on that virtualization platform or built by our previous generation of automation get it all natively through Horizon. So we're, we're driving toward Horizon as the front end for all of our, all of our operations. Turn it over to Sridhar. Hey, hello. So what I'll do is over the next few slides dive more into detail in terms of what our infrastructure uh, architecture looks like. Mostly I'll focus on the infrastructure as a service aspects of it, but uh, I can uh, touch on some of the platform as a service capabilities that we're going after as well. Um, if you look at our um, virtual hosting environment, um, where it was about, uh, um, around 2011, so our journey started in 2009, but um, uh, towards the end of uh, 2012, es uh, essentially we had uh, around 75% of our uh, office and enterprise environment uh, virtualized. Right now we are running about uh, close to 17,000 VMs on top of this infrastructure. And uh, where we started, where we were in 2011, essentially if you were to categorize our uh, uh, environment, you can uh, categorize into pr basically three primary vectors. There is an internal facing, vec uh, internal facing environment and a significant portion is non-enclaved and then there is a, a, re um, a, um, a reasonable portion that is enclaved and then there is an inter internet facing uh, element for, for that. And as you go through that, what you'll see is there is an increasing amount of uh, segmentation and security uh, as uh, you go from the left to the right. So I'll, I'll start to uh, walk through some of the details uh, from uh, the network up. Um, so in terms of if you look at the, our internal environment, um, um, the non-enclave piece, piece of the environment, you have a physical network, you are typically leveraging network services like load balancer, 
um, which is more, more commonly uh, used uh, network service in that uh, environment. And then what you have is uh, large shared networks that all the application tenants share. Um, primarily because there is uh, not as much a need for uh, enclaving in this space, so you use shared networks thereof to make it um, easier from that perspective. We do use, um, from a, a compute perspective, we are using a proprietary hypervisor, and we run the uh, proprietary virtual switch on top of it, and the only um, network service that we are virtualizing there is um, the switching capability. Um, and uh, on, uh, backing this, uh, uh, all the VMs that are landed on here are, la are using a proprietary storage, a scale-up storage that, um, underneath. And then what we have uh, uh, on top of it, yeah, go ahead. Oh, but basically Enclave, all it means is that uh, you, uh, it is a segmented portion of the infrastructure that is, uh, at, the, at the core level, is separated by a firewall so that there's more security um, uh, to basically, for, for the applications uh, that are being hosted there. So typically, Intel has uh, these uh, four different classifications of data. Um, so there is public data, there's Intel confidential, there is restricted secret and secret. So the, the, as you go towards dealing with a higher level of confidentiality, the, uh, you have to apply, apply more and more security controls. So that's what you're seeing as you uh, go down the scale. And even within the enclave, there are actually the additional segmentation that we have. I'm not showing it here for simplicity purposes. So there is an element that is, uh, 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 that is designed to host Intel confidential and lower data. And then anything that is restricted secret and uh, secret, it has uh, even higher level of uh, uh, security, se uh, security controls that we apply. And that is actually physically segmented today. So that's one of the things that, uh, uh, that you're seeing uh, right here. There's a, def a differentiation in terms of as you go to, uh, is you're seeing more and more granular network segmentation as you go into that space. Because you have to segment one application from the other, with the theory being that uh, if one application gets compromised, to prevent it, that compromise to extend to the other environments, you want to lock it down into a container. That's why. Um, and in the um, non enclave environment, uh, Greg had indicated that there is some custom automation that we have written that allows uh, you to uh, provision VMs in a self-service manner. But uh, what we do, the, uh, what we were doing there is primarily the provisioning aspect of it. But once it is provisioned, there is less control that folks have in a self-service manner on, to, on, on top of those VMs. And then as you go into the enclave space, because of a lot of the segmentation and uh, having to make a decision in terms of which network do I land a VM on, uh, there is a, a lot, we essentially uh, were doing manual provisioning there, uh, relying on a cloud administrator or a, one of our hosting administrators to make, uh, provision um, uh, VMs in that space. So this is one of the things that uh, we are trying to address and have a consistent interface uh, as we go along um, our journey. That, that's where OpenStack and, uh, uh, comes into play. So uh, what I'll show you is different uh, ways in, uh, the different flavors of what single control plane means to us. One is from the perspective of having a consistent in, uh, interface across our environments, where you saw previously some were, uh, some were behind a custom portal, some were behind uh, manual provisioning, and so there was differences in terms of uh, the, the capabilities across those environments. So what OpenStack uh, um, uh, is giving us, which uh, we've been uh, evolving our uh, um, OpenStack-based cloud environment over the last two and a half to three years. And uh, here's where you see we are using the, the open APIs to expose the underlying uh, infrastructure in a way that not only uh, uh, users can use from a GUI perspective, but developers can actually lever uh, use those APIs to um, run higher level structures, uh, automation structures on top of that, to basically deploy groups of VMs or um, do network self-service, uh, do storage self-service on top of that. So here, uh, what you're seeing is again, you're uh, we're differentiating a non-enclave and then an enclave environment. But one of the things that we're doing is we're collapsing what you saw as a non-enclave and uh, enclave environment into the same compute pool. And you're able to offer the, um, uh, the same level of capability across that. So the, what we are, where we are moving towards is just an internal facing and an external facing, internet facing environment. So again, um, so few things to highlight here. As you move on to the physical network, um, on the uh, Enclave side, we are changing our security architecture, which I'll touch, uh, uh, touch on in the next couple of slides. Um, 
In terms of key transitions that we are, uh, that we are seeing in this space is we, are, we have been using open source technologies. So you see KVM as a hypervisor using open source storage in this environment. Um, essentially, we use Ceph in that space. Uh, there is an image repository that is, uh, that is exposed via glance. So all these capabilities that is allowing us to uh, do things in a more uh, automated manner, which we were doing uh, more manually before. Okay. And OpenStack is at the control uh, is, uh, uh, is the control pane that uh, sits on top of all of this. So where we are headed to in 2014 is uh, we want to extend this. Uh, OpenStack control plane, not only across these new environments that we've been working and advancing over the last couple of years, but to have it across all of our um, virtualization environment, which is uh, across all of the 17,000 VMs that we have by the end of the year. Uh, so what that means is uh, we're transitioning from where our OpenStack-based environment is purely uh, using KVM as a hypervisor to a hybrid hypervisor environment. So essentially use the same control plane, but uh, be able to provision across um, uh, uh, multiple hypervisors. So this goes along with our strategy um, where uh, for all of our infrastructure components in general, we look to dual source um, the servers, the network, as well as the hypervisors in this case, as well as the storage elements. So it fits in that type of model where you can have a consistent API, but you are actually able to um, change infrastructure solutions in the back end while the customer's experience hasn't changed. Okay? That's really the key. Um, so again, we're using those same APIs that we uh, talked about, and uh, as you indicated, uh, as I indicated, uh, you are, um, we are moving in a direction where we are able to support multiple hypervisors. Um, we are able to uh, support multiple storage solutions, so both scale up and scale, uh, scale out storage uh, from, from that perspective. Um, and another thing that you see is uh, the use of the trusted compute pools, by, um, uh, which is allowing us to basically collapse those internal and um, uh, enclaves and non-enclave elements. So on the same common resource pool. Where we were segmenting the, uh, the compute resource pools previously, we were not getting um, the best use of the resources. Whereas by uh, combining those and using trusted compute pools, you're actually able to land your secure workloads on um, uh, secured, uh, secure systems or trust attested systems. And that's, uh, that's what allows us to use a common resource pool there. Okay. Um, actually, one more thing I want to highlight is we are actually also using Heat and Murano as um, a high level APIs that allow us to provision collections of systems where we can create a policy um, uh, in terms of uh, you, if you want to uh, deploy a multi-tier application uh, which has, with, applic uh, with uh, web server, application, and database, and in addition, it ha needs to have a certain uh, type of security policy implemented, all that you can define in terms of uh, in a heap template and be able to deploy it that way. Right? So that's uh, another way uh, where we are leveraging uh, open APIs at all. So the other thing is that we have done is, as we have evolved, um, we are changing the, the security model in terms of how we had implemented it before OpenStack, uh, um, our journey with OpenStack, and uh, how we are going forward. What we mean by that is, uh, where previously our perimeter was primarily, our access control was primarily being implemented, on a hardware-based firewalls, and were, um, these were monolithic firewalls that we were implementing the access control on. We are moving to more a layered perimeter, a distributed security model, where uh, the controls are being implemented on the hardware for firewalls more towards the edge of the data center. Then you have a, what we are calling as a tenant and a zone perimeter. So essentially, you define security zones, and then you have uh, uh, tenants within that. So each tenant at, 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 at the tenant edge, we are applying controls on the hypervisor. And then within the intra zone, you, we are again using security groups to create segmentation uh, within, the, um, uh, within the tenant. What that allows us to do is, especially when you look at internet facing uh, environments, we used to have separate physically segmented pools of uh, compute for uh, say a web server layer, a database layer, and an app layer. All those we're able to collapse and actually uh, are able to run it on top of uh, the same, same resource pool. Okay. 
So this kind of gives you a view, a conceptual design of what that looks like. So what we are separating out is there is a shared infrastructure and hosting services layer which provides services like, uh, say, uh, uh, LDAP capabilities, identity, uh, patch management, and things of that nature, DNS being another example, these are common services that we will leverage in a hosting environment, that we provide in a, um, a shared uh, manner. And then you have the individual tenants, and by virtue of uh, creating an SDN layer on top of our uh, uh, environment, we are able to create richer, model, richer network models where on self-service, each tenant can get their own private uh, network space and create their application within that allows us to uh, basically segment them from the other applications. So previously, we had to do this manually, and uh, what that used to cause us deploying an application uh, from uh, the, when the customer engages to actually get them live, it could take uh, several weeks by the time we provision them, provision the network, provision uh, the, the VMs, as well as uh, the security associated with that. So all that is now cut down where they can implement this in, uh, in less than an hour or less than a day if they have all their pieces together. So basically everything is uh, done in a self-service manner from this perspective. Right? So the, the, another element in which we are looking at a single control plane is by using an orchestration layer, by using OpenStack, uh, not to not only provision to our private cloud environments, but also to a public cloud environment. We've done, a, um, we've done um, uh, implemented hybrid clouds uh, against uh, some of the cloud, uh, pu public common public cloud, uh, some of the popular pu public cloud providers out there. Uh, but one of the key th changes in strategy that we are going after at this point is uh, to interact more with cloud providers that expose an OpenStack API. Uh, and the benefit there is that um, we don't have to write an additional abstraction layer or leverage um, uh, other abstraction, uh, another solution for creating that abstraction uh, between a public and a private, private cloud. Um, so that basically allows us to optimize the, the, and leverage the automation that we already have, but be able to provide provision both to public and private. And um, so this is more of a, the, the, our first stage is to, uh, implement OpenStack across all of our private cloud environments, and then as we progress towards the latter half of this year and early next year, this is where uh, we're going to uh, essentially expand that to uh, public clouds as well. What we are doing right now is doing the, the proof of concepts with a couple of vendors uh, to essentially um, experiment and uh, refine our strategy from a hybrid cloud perspective. Okay, and with that, I'll hand over to Greg to walk through our automation framework. Okay. <clears throat> so, so for us, um, you know, just just in general terms, you know, cl cloud itself is is an inflection point for how how we do hosting, right? And and OpenStack is is the perfect time for us to be really doubling down on driving some cultural workforce and uh, business transformations across the board, right? And. You, you know, the tendency is to kind of, kind of attach to, you know, fancy buzzwords, you know, CI, CD, Agile, training on tools. The, these all tend, tend to uh, ca cause people some target fixation, right? And, and really for us to be successful in, in a, a broader cloud sense and in an OpenStack sense, we, we need to, to acknowledge and act upon some, uh, some additional dimensions, right? Uh, Intel IT is an established IT shop. We have... Um, pr pr pretty mature processes for the way we used to do things. And running, running a hybrid cloud strategy mandates that we, um, we, we transform or become irrelevant, right? So team structure and, and composition, just, just the way that we've historically put teams together in IT, right? You have your hypervisor expert, you've got a storage expert, a, net, a network expert, um, your Windows and your Linux guys. And, and throw them together and, and uh, you know, kind of expect to have a, a high performing team. And that's, that's worked in the past, but in, in, in the cloud future, right, running cloud at scale, we, we really need to drive toward these pluggable resources. So these, these we, we, we call them T-shaped resources, where they're, they're able to go very deep on some technology, but they're also very broad and quite pluggable. We can use them around the, uh, the infrastructure as needed. Our software engineering processes 
right? Uh, Intel IT has historically been a waterfall shop. You know, driving, driving toward the agile end of the spectrum is, is hard, right? I, I, I hear all the time, oh, agile doesn't work. It's, it's not gonna work for us, but uh, it, it has to. And, and it does work when, when done right, it's just painful. Uh, it's, it's painful to get there and you have to have some faith that uh, you're going to get there, you're going to reap the, the, the benefits. Workforce transformation, right? We've, we've got a you know, pr pretty mature workforce in terms of skills. They're, they're, they're able to do their jobs very well, but in this cloud model where we're, we're changing the way we build teams and we're changing the, the how of uh, delivery of uh, cloud infrastructure and cloud applications, uh, it, it, it forces us to um, transform the, the, the skills of our workforce, right? So, so bring them ahead, get away from process and tool-centric skills and drive toward the software engineering discipline, the large-scale system administration end of the spectrum. Um, support models, right? Level one, level two, level three. These are established and quite mature, but they also introduce a, you know, handoffs. Handoffs and some, some uh, accumulated time as, as we, we try to work through problems. So driving to DevOps models where they make sense. They, they, they don't universally make sense. We're, we're still getting our, our heads around where, where we will use them, but it it, it will be a spectrum of support models from, you know, post post implementation hardware support, kind of kind of the bone bone standard, all the way up to the really uh, highly agile, highly innovative end of the spectrum at the top, the DevOps end, right? And and for us to be able to do this, we need to measure ourselves a little bit differently, right? We as, as an idle shop. Um, we have KPIs, and these are how we measure ourselves, but in, in a DevOps world, as we're driving toward the software engineering end of the spectrum, then we need to start bringing in some of the metrics that are relevant to software. Um, you know, how many releases did we do over such and such a time? You know, how, you know, also including um, you know, think things that are more mundane, like how many, how many servers per admin? Um, are, are we supporting these? These are the additional metrics beyond the KPIs that are kind of kind of the standard um, idle playbook, right? So the the metric scorecard is important. Being able to measure yourself is crucial. Being able to fold in these new metrics and have them become normal is uh, very important. And then red is good, right? <laughs> when you have a dashboard and there's some red on it, pe people kind of lose their minds and get get really concerned. But for for us doing DevOps, you know, delivering cloud infrastructure, red is good because we know where the problems are, we know where to focus our energies. And then in our release and quality assurance realm, right, these, these are no longer separate teams of resources bringing a bucket brigade methodology to QAing what gets released, right? In, in a test-driven development shop, um, everybody's doing QA, and they're doing QA first and it's, it's, it's just part of the software release process through, through automation, through CI/CD. So, so actually automating deployment. You know, we've, we've got a hugely complex environment. We've been guilty of um, building automation and deploying it by hand in the past, uh, and, and then expecting the environment to remain static, not drift, not break. Not, not cause problems. So how, how do we continually um, improve the system, deploy it to a specific specification, and be able to you know, pound out clouds as frequently as we, as we have to, whether it's in a lab environment, in a dev environment, or, or the production environment itself. So con continuous integration and, and delivery really is delivery of, of infrastructure, right? And we, we are at the maturity level where we're starting to shift to continuous delivery. We're not um, sophisticated enough where we think that continuous deployment is gonna be a thing for us in, in the infrastructure space, but, but as we mature over time, we, we would get there and the bedrock is laid through continuous delivery, right? It's, it's the, the automation still pushes the software updates out to the environment the exact same way. It's just a, a, a human drives it. And then, you know, longer term for us, infrastructure CI is really what, what we envision metal as a service to be. Metal as a service plus plus. So the, the lower left hand uh, graphic kind of kind of depicts where we are today, what we're turning on uh, this week in, in, in an environment. It's um, 
deploying our own cloud infrastructure through automation, CI, CD, nothing gets to the production environment unless it flowed down this automated path to production. But we've got additional use cases that um, are, are targeted for, for later in the year when, uh, or not, not later in the year, next year when um, things like Ironic get, get uh, a little bit further down the path where we will have targeted use cases to, to be able to deliver end using applications on, on, on metal to customers, right? And then ultimately we will find ourselves back in our software development and validation lab environments where customers can consume the same framework to um, deliver products to, to market. And, and really, you know, for us, metal as a service is, is a game changer, right? We've, we've got a, a huge silicon design environment. Um, a, a bunch of us working in the cloud space today came out of that environment, came over to the enterprise space to work on this cloud stuff. And we really see that we'll, we'll link up eventually where we're talking about our, our industrial workloads that are taping out SFC projects or validating software projects are just running on a platform, running on infrastructure, and it's, it's really no different than cloud applications running on a platform, running on infrastructure. So metal as a service becomes a game changer once it's as easy to get metal as it is to get virtual en masse. And we can take um, you know, the pets versus cattle kind of meme and drive that to, to the foundation. It, it, it changes everything that we do. All right, we're on to QA. Um, 2014 focus areas, rolling upgrades, no, no tenant downtime for resources or services, um, connection into all existing infrastructure, so a single control plane is, is our, our biggest focus for the year, disaster recovery between sites for VM tenants, restart a VM when a host fails, hybrid cloud uh, enabled through Horizon, and then using um, OpenStack to do um, a, a additional work, right? So backup and recovery, we still have you know, kind of the, the traditional media master client kind of architecture for, for bar. We, we, we need to drive that forward. Bare metal provisioning, as I mentioned, some of the higher order load balancing firewall um, type as a service type automation. And then, you know, we, we will, We've got some proprietary code around database as a service, load balancer as a service that will be displaced uh, with OpenStack going, going forward, Think, things like Trove, right? So in, in, in summary, our direction is federated, interoperable, open cloud. Um, you know, the, the single control plane provides a, a compelling glide path to, to get us there, right? It doesn't. Uh, displace or rip and replace all of our past investments. It, it really up levels the capability that we deliver to our customers. So it, it, uh, it, it's highly compelling in, in that uh, regard. And then in order for us to run Cloud of Scale, we're still going to be focused on IT culture, uh, our skill set, con continuing to tweak our business process, so, so you know, including governance, right? And then down, down to the uh, technology discussions. So what we uh, are doing is we have a, uh, implemented uh, an SDN as an overlay network on top of our hypervisors. So and and then we are leveraging two different models. Uh, for networks uh, where we have those non-enclave environments, we are still using shared, uh, shared networks with VLANs extended. And then uh, where we have uh, our more secured uh, environments, there uh, the model that we're going after is a pertinent uh, router with uh, private networks behind it. So that's how we are uh, getting the segmentation um, from a network perspective. The next thing that we are actually w working towards is, uh, so this addresses the virtual environment. For the physical environment, as um, we want to introduce a similar uh, level of abstraction that allows us to simplify our underlying uh, network fabric. 
Um, uh, so along with the uh, uh, ironic or uh, whether we introduce an open V switch on the physical switches, whether we do open flow. So that's an area of research that we have that we are investigating so that eventually we are able to abstract even the physical servers from the underlying uh, network. So. Any other questions? All right, hey, thanks everyone. Thank you, folks.